In last week's video, I explained why some people believe that human endogenous retrovirus W causes multiple sclerosis, and today we'll look at the drug being developed for MS, Temelumab, which targets a protein produced by this virus. But does it work? In this video, I'll explain Temelumab and show the results of three clinical trials. Any detailed description of endogenous retroviruses is beyond the scope of this video. Please see the link in the description below for last week's video, but very briefly, these are viruses which infected our ancestors millions of years ago, but they became incorporated into our genome and persist to this day. A lot of them have mutations, they don't do anything, but some of them produce active virus and may play a role in certain human diseases. This is a diagram of a retrovirus getting into the cell using envelope protein ENV, which is believed to be part of the pathogenesis of MS, at least by some people. And endogenous retroviruses use use ribonucleic acid or RNA for their genome, but they use the enzyme reverse transcriptase to make viral DNA and the enzyme integrase to get into our genome and then use our own cells machinery to make copies of itself and potentially spread throughout the genome. And there's evidence that one particular human endogenous retrovirus, HERV-W, plays a role in MS. For instance, this is a study looking at the brains of people with MS compared to other neurological diseases, OND in this diagram, such as Parkinson's disease, or normal brain controls, people without neurological diseases, and it shows that there was more expression of HERV-W RNA, both on the envelope protein and pull compared to control, suggesting more activation of the virus in people with MS. And HERV-W may also play a role in the prognosis of MS. This is a study looking at people who already have multiple sclerosis and they tested their cerebral spinal fluid and some people had evidence of HERV-W labeled in black compared to people without the virus in their cerebral spinal fluid labeled in gray. And the people with virus seem to do worse, for instance, in the center of the diagram looking at relapses. People who had HERV-W in the spinal fluid had more relapses. They looked at EDSS, expanded disability status scale, prior to and at the end of the study. EDSS1 is at the beginning of the study. EDSS2 is at the end of the study. And you can see people had greater disability who had the virus. They also looked at the number of functional systems involved prior to the study and at the end of the study, FS2. Functional systems would be like the motor system, strength, vision, visual system, cerebellar system, and there was a tendency for people who had the virus in their cerebrospinal fluid to have more functional systems involved by the end of the study. And Temelumab could potentially be the first proven treatment against any human endogenous retrovirus, and there are a lot of studies on small molecules that have been used previously in HIV, like reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and they don't have great data, but Temelumab has the advantage of being more specific and targets a specific antigen because it's actually a recombinant immunoglobin and it highly specifically targets the envelope protein of HERV-W. And there's a lot of evidence that this envelope protein in general may be part of the pathogenesis in MS. And of course, if you block the envelope protein necessary for transmission of the virus from cell to cell, you're slowing down spreading of the virus. It has a very long half-life, approximately one month. And although it's not known exactly how it might work, there are a few proposed mechanisms of action. One, it's known that this protein, the envelope protein of HERB-W, binds a toll-like receptor and activates microglia. Microglia are cells in the central nervous system within the brain and spinal cord that are thought to be driving the slow smoldering inflammation. They're not part of the adaptive immune system, the B and T cells. So right from the start, we think this drug could be more effective at slowing down progression in multiple sclerosis, but maybe less effective at stopping relapses and new MRI lesions, and we should keep that in mind when we're interpreting the clinical trials. Furthermore, there's some evidence that this drug, Temelumab, may improve the function of OPCs, or oligodendrocyte precursor cells. These are precursors to oligodendrocytes, the cells that produce myelin, the fatty sheath, which covers nerve fibers within the central nervous system.
And as a brief aside, temelumab is being studied in other diseases as well. In MS, the phase two study is completed, which I'll show you in a moment, but it's also being studied in so-called long COVID, people with prolonged unexplained symptoms after COVID-19 infection. And there's some basic science evidence that people with that syndrome may have greater activation of HERV-W. It's also being studied in ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So now we'll move to the results of clinical trials. And first we'll start with the pilot study published in 2014. They called a phase 2A study just because they did look at clinical outcomes, but it's a very small study, only 10 people with multiple sclerosis, and it's a study of GNBAC1, which is now called temelumab. And they had only one person with relapse and remitting MS, nine had progressive multiple sclerosis, and it was open label, meaning people knew if they were getting the drug or not, so it wasn't a blinded trial. And it was randomized, but they used a crossover design, meaning that everyone would get the drug at some point. And that's how you recruit people into these early trials where no one knows if the drug is effective or safe. And it was given IV for a total of five doses every four weeks, and so it was a relatively short trial. And people were randomized to get the drug at two milligrams per kilogram as a single IV infusion, or six milligrams per kilogram, or placebo. Now these doses you'll see are quite low, and in subsequent trials they kept trying to increase the dose because they weren't really getting any dose-dependent side effects, and they thought a higher dose could be more effective. Now there was no clear benefit to this drug in this small and short trial with only 10 patients. It was well tolerated, no major side effects, no one had a relapse out of the 10 patients in the study, and only one out of 10 developed a new lesion on MRI, but the drug appears to be safe at least in this brief and small study. And this set the stage for the CHANGE MS study. This is a larger 48-week, close to one year, randomized control trial. And they recruited 48 participants, all with relapsing remitting MS. And you can see they used a higher dose, temelumab 6, 12, or 18 milligrams per kilogram. So they tripled the dose versus placebo. And there was an also an extension phase up to a total of 96 weeks called ANGEL MS. I'll show you the data of this. Of course, they were unblinded in the second year, but I think it's important to see the full data because these medications may take time to show some effect, particularly if they're affecting smoldering inflammation. But it's not clear that temelumab did anything, at least in terms of inflammatory activity. The primary outcome was new enhancing or active lesions on MRI, and there were no statistically significant differences between any of the groups. For placebo, the mean number of new active lesions was 8.9. This is during the treatment period, 12 to 24 weeks. In the high dose group, it was 18 milligrams per kilogram. It was 5.3 new active lesions. So there is a difference there, but it wasn't statistically significant. And for the 12 milligram per kilogram dose, 6.9 new active lesions. For the 6 milligram per kilogram dose, it was 8.4 new active lesions. So there's maybe some trend towards something happening with a higher dose. Now, I just want to say I strongly, strongly suspect that this entire chart is somehow an error. It's simply not plausible that all four groups could average more than five active lesions during a 12-week period. That simply doesn't happen. This would be by far the most active group of individuals ever to enter an MS clinical trial. I don't know what's happening here. I read it multiple times. If someone understands this, please post in the comments below. There was also no difference in annualized relapse rate, relapses per person per year. Looking at EDSS progression, disability progression, it occurred in 3.8% or two out of 53 people getting the high dose of temelumab, 18 milligrams per kilogram, and 9.1% or five out of 55 in people getting placebo. Obviously, this is not a statistically significant difference, but the authors thought maybe we're on to something, maybe we can push the dose even higher because it seemed to be safe. In terms of brain atrophy, shrinkage of the brain, there were no statistically significant differences. You can see placebo, the green line ends up right in the middle, but hey, the high dose, temelumab, 18 milligrams per kilogram, does end up with the least atrophy, a non-statistically significant trend. Again, maybe we can increase 
the dose because we're on to something. And that's exactly what they did in the Protect MS study. Now, this is just from a press release. I don't have the full publication. This is coming from the drug company. So take it with a grain of salt. But as you can see, they tried a higher dose. They randomized people to get 18 milligrams per kilogram, 36 or 54, so tripling the dose a second time. And they did this study in Stockholm, Sweden, where they use a lot of rituximab to treat MS. Rituximab is an IV infusion which depletes B cells similar to Ocrevus, Casimpta, and Briumvi, and it's very effective in preventing relapses in new MRI lesions, and it does have some evidence in progressive MS. For instance, the Olympus trial done in primary progressive MS at UC San Francisco, but some people have progression despite having no relapses, and those are exactly the individuals who were recruited into this study. They thought maybe we, if we can add this other drug, we can stop this smoldering, slow inflammation within old MS lesions. They had 40 participants, so still a small study, and it was a one-year trial. And the outcome showed that timelimab was safe even at the 54 milligram per kilogram dose, but there were no clear clinical benefits, though you might not expect to see them in a relatively small study. And they did have some reason for optimism. And to give you a sense who was in the study, these are the baseline characteristics of people who are randomized to just get rituximab alone with placebo or randomized to get rituximab with one of the doses of temelumab, 18 milligrams per kilogram, 36 or 54. And you can see the average age was around 45 to 50. And there are some imbalances here because it's a small sample size. For instance, the average age in people getting rituximab alone was 49.5 versus 45 in people getting the lower dose of temelumab with rituximab. Most people were female, a little over 50%, which makes sense. The average disease duration was about 10 years years. Again, there's some variability here. Most people he had relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, but a small number had progressive MS. And the average EDSS, a measure of disability, was around 4.0, which is moderate disability, people walking without a cane, but with some measurable neurologic deficits. And most people, in fact, only one single person out of 40 had a relapse in the prior year. So these people were essentially free of relapse activity prior to the study. In terms of the clinical results, not a single person in the entire study had even one relapse, so obviously there were no differences between the groups. In terms of new MRI lesions, there were very few new lesions. In the different groups, there was either one or two new MRI lesions. Obviously, no statistically significant differences. This is gadolinium or active lesions, and this is all new T2 lesions exactly the same. So you can see it would be impossible to show a difference in MRI activity or relapses because a Essentially, people were quite stable, which is to be expected in everyone taking rituximab. But they did show some significant differences when looking at other MRI outcomes. Now, keep in mind that these so-called surrogate markers don't always translate into clinically meaningful differences, but the data are quite impressive. What they did is to increase their statistical power, they combined the three groups that received temelumab. So they're just comparing people who receive rituximab alone to people who receive rituximab to some dose of temelumab, and they looked at atrophy or shrinkage of the cortex, the surface of the brain, the gray matter, and they showed 55% less atrophy, a very significant difference. This is data on magnetization transfer, a form of multimodal MRI, which is thought to correlate with myelin integrity based on some other studies. This is not a commonly used metric, take it with a grain of salt, but they did show people getting rituximab alone versus rituximab with temelumab. People in the second group had 44% more increase in magnetization transfer, possibly signaling greater gains in myelin integrity. This is the data on neurofilament light chain, which is a breakdown product of the central nervous system in the cerebral spinal fluid. It's known that higher levels of NFL are associated with worse prognosis and more progression in MS, though the correlation is weak. This looks at the change from baseline in the spinal fluid, and both groups increased for unknown reasons as far as I'm concerned, but there was a 33% lower increase in people who were getting rituximab 
plus tamelamab. However, that's not so impressive to me because they seem to have an increase in this marker from baseline when they were already on rituximab and it's known to associate with worse prognosis. And finally, GFAP or gliofibrillary acidic protein, another marker of central nervous system damage, though perhaps less robustly associated with MS. In the cerebral spinal fluid in people getting rituximab alone, it increased, but in people getting both rituximab and tamelamab, it actually decreased. There weren't any serious adverse events with tamelamab as far as I could see. There were two serious adverse events in the study. One person getting rituximab alone had a UTI, urinary tract infection, leading to hospitalization. Another person in the tamelamab 18 milligrams per kilogram group got COVID-19 and had to be hospitalized, but I would attribute both of these to rituximab, an immunosuppressant known to increase both the risk of UTIs and severe COVID-19, not to tamelamab. So putting it all together, is this enough? Should they go forward with a large phase three trial? Well, according to Genuro, the company which markets tamelamab, Genuro will now resume discussions with regulatory authorities and with potential partners to define the best development path combining tamelamab and anti-neuroinflammatory treatments to bring the synergistic benefits of tamelamab to patients. And I'll add my own personal opinion. One, can tamelamab work as a traditional disease-modifying therapy? Absolutely not. It's not going to stop new MRI lesions or relapses at a sufficient rate, but could it work as an add-on therapy in addition maybe to a traditional disease-modifying therapy or for someone with inactive progressive multiple sclerosis due to this smoldering inflammation? Maybe. It's definitely unproven, but I wouldn't write it off. It's very, very difficult to show a clinical difference in a short trial. Often there's a therapeutic lag, and you really have to measure people over time and have a larger sample size. So I personally would like to see a phase three trial just to see it to the end and see if it actually work. What I would suggest if I were to advise the drug company is Try to study anyone of any age. Realistically, you don't have to exclude people because they're stable. Anyone can develop progression. There's strong evidence that some people have PIRA, progression independent of relapse activity, even if they don't perceive that to be true. Try to convince the FDA to allow a composite outcome. It's very difficult to show a difference in EDSS progression because someone could have an EDSS of 6.0, be using a cane, be getting worse, but at the end of the study, they still have an EDSS of 6.0, whereas it's much easier to show differences in things like time 25 foot walk, nine hole peg test, and I wish the FDA would comply with that. Of course, I don't make the rules. So I think they should include people who are already on disease-modifying therapies or off disease-modifying therapies of any age, ideally 18 to much older than 55, which is the cutoff used in many progressive MS trials. Unfortunately, if you had a composite outcome, I think you could show a difference in older people if the drug was in fact effective. Now, obviously, Genero is not a big drug company. They're probably looking to sell this product to a larger drug company that actually has the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in capital to actually make the phase three three clinical trial work. They're very difficult to do and very expensive, but I would like to see it to the end. I'd be interested to know what you think about this product, Tamelamab, and if you have suggestions for other videos.